All right, so before we get back to the notes, let's go over these, these warm-ups. Again, these could be sample multi-choice questions, 5-1 through 5-4. Four seven six eight five two one point three six eight. That's a huge angle in degrees. We want to know where the angle that is coterminal with it between zero and three sixty lives. So what's our strategy? Take that angle and do what? Divide by three sixty, which is the number of degrees in one rotation. So this gives us rotations, which we don't care about the full rotation, so we subtract out one, three, two, four, five, and uh, you get more decimals appearing. So that rotation is less than one, so we then multiply by 360 to convert it back to degrees, and you end up with 321.368. And that's your answer, right? 321.368, what are the units? Degrees, some people are still missing unit points on pre-response, it was on the, on the last test, you got one check for the unit, and some people were not getting that, so those, are, those, those should be freebies. Now, for what it's worth, let's go ahead and find the reference angle. How do we find the reference angle? Subtract that from 360, good, because that is a quadrant uh, four angle. So we're stopping short of, well, I'll just do this. There we go. So the reference angle is 38.631. And of course, reference angles always have to be two types. They have to be both positive and, what's the other thing? Acute, right? They have to be between 0 and 90, and some people still aren't doing that. All right, so the next one, very similar, except we have it in radians. So what's our strategy there? Negative 5, 9, 6, 2, 1, 4. And the way I taught you was to divide that by what? 46, twice the denominator. Why twice the denominator? 2 pi, right, 46 by 23rd. So there's your full rotations. You say plus one, two, nine, six, one to get rid of the full rotations. And you re-multiply by the same number, 46. And this gives you your new coefficient. But now it's time to interpret your calculator. It's trying to tell you that it should be what? Negative eight. Yeah. So the coterminal angle, come over here, the coterminal angle would be negative eight pi 23rds which is a coterminal angle, but is that between zero and two pi? No, so what do we have to do one last time? Add one more rotation to it, 46 pi 23rds. And what is 46 minus eight? 38 pi 23rds. 38 pi 23rds. Let's figure out the reference angle for that. How do we figure out where 38 pi 23rds lives? Remember, pi is the same as 23 pi 23rds. What's half of 23? 11.5, good. What's 23 plus 11.5? 34.5 pi 23rds. And of course, all the way around will be 46 pi 23rds. So 38, remember 38 then is going to go all the way around past 34.5 and get into quadrant 4. So the reference angle is this right here. So it's 46 minus 38, which is 8. Good. 8 by 20 thirds. So a question like that, I could ask you for any number of things. I could ask you for the coterminal angle between 0 and 2 pi. I could just ask you for the reference angle which would require you to do all that work. And I like that question better. What is the reference angle? Okay. Remember, the reference angle is how far are we away from the closest x-axis? The closest x-axis is 46, and we're at 38. Yeah, so 46 minus 38 gives you your pi 23rds coefficient. All right, and then this one down here. If theta equals inverse cosecant, of negative 3.621 and secant is less than zero in degrees, what is theta? All right, so this is super important. Um, <clears throat> first of all, if I have sine of theta equals um, f of x, or I, I, should, I guess I should say f of x, what does x represent? An angle, right? We take trig functions of angles to find what? What does f of x represent? Ratios. Two of, three, two 
of the three sides of the triangle. Okay, so anytime you have a sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, or cotangent of something, that something has to be an angle. Has to be. And then you're going to be finding a ratio. But on the flip side, if I have inverse sine of x equals, I'm just going to say f of x again, what does this x represent? That's a ratio. And now f of x would represent a what? An angle. You have to have your inputs and outputs squared away. All right? You only take inverse signs of ratios to find angles. You take trig functions of angles to find ratios. If you don't have your inputs and outputs straight, um, you're not going to get right answers. So if I ask you cosecant, inverse cosecant, and I'll just rewrite it down here, inverse cosecant, I'll get there, of negative 3.621. Even if I didn't have it set equal to anything, then negative 3.621 you'd have to infer as a what? An angle or a ratio? It has to be a ratio. How do we know? It follows an inverse trig function. Yeah, it has to be a ratio. And so we're looking for an angle. Now, do we have a cosecant button on our calculator? No. So we have to go through which function? Sine. So I have to take the inverse sine of the sine ratio. How can I get the sine ratio if I currently have the cosecant ratio? Put a 1 over it? Yeah. The cosecant ratio and the sine ratios are what of each other? Starts with R and rhymes with uh, preciprocal. Reciprocal, yeah. So it would be 1 over, as you said, negative 3.621. That's what you type into your calculator. You don't take random combinations of inverses and reciprocals. You understand what you're doing. The ratio are the reciprocals. The angles are not. All right? And if you don't want to do it that way, you can actually solve for uh, the ratio. You could take the cosecant of both sides, and you get negative 3.621 equals cosecant of theta. And therefore, sine of theta of the same theta must equal 1 over negative 3.621. And now you could take the inverse sine of both sides. But you don't even have to do that if you realize what it is you're asked to do. Okay, so now I have something I could type into my calculator, but I need to know where theta lives. If cosecant is negative and secant is negative, that puts me in quadrant what? If cosecant and secant are both negative. Quadrant 3. Good, quadrant 3. So there's the theta I want, and do I want to be in degrees or radians? degrees. So anytime you're finding an angle, you need to make sure you're in the correct mode. So this is what I'm going to type in. I'm going to type in inverse sine of 1 over negative 3.621, and I'll make sure I'm in degree mode. Uh, who knows what mode I was in? Hey, I was in degrees. What do you know? One less thing to do. So second sine of 1 divided by negative 3.621. And remember, the calculator is not necessarily going to give me the answer I want. It gives me negative 16. What quadrant is negative 16 in? Quadrant 4. The other quadrant where sine is positive. What's the reference angle of negative 16? Positive 16. So I'm just going to say times negative 1, and now I have my reference angle. And now based upon my picture, the reference angle is right here. It's 16. My picture says I need to do what with 16 to get my angle? Add 180 to it, yeah. So theta is going to equal, if we add it all in there, we'll just say now plus 180. Uh, you get 196.031. Now, very quickly, let's check. Let's take the cosecant of that angle. How do I type in the cosecant of that angle if I don't have a cosecant button? Not one over inverse sign. Yeah. Because now notice this, right? Cosecant of theta is 1 over sine of what? The same theta. The exact same theta. So let's go ahead and see if we do, in fact, get our answer of negative 3.621. 1 divided by sine of the answer, second negative, should give us 
negative 3.621, and it does. All right, so if you get in the habit of checking your work, not only do you get the right answer, but it reinforces the ideas that you're doing. All right, any questions on those three fantastic, awesome, wonderful warm-ups? Three multiple choice questions in theory. Hopefully three checks on the test. All right, well, let's then go back to the notes. And um, <clears throat> we are going to jump down to um, example 11. All right, we're going to kind of skip around here. because we've had so much practice. <clears throat> okay, so it says to sketch at least one cycle. And again, I don't really like those instructions. My new instructions are at least two cycles with um, greater than or equal to one negative critical value, which I'll abbreviate CV. So you always have to have at least one critical value in negative land. Now, how many critical values does it take for two cycles? We talked about that the other day. Nine critical values equals two cycles. It takes five for one, but only nine for two because, again, the fifth critical value is the last critical value for the first cycle and the first critical value for the next cycle. So it doubles. Can you have more than nine critical values? Sure, yeah. But at least nine, and one of those has to be negative. <clears throat> All right, step one. Uh, put it into standard transformation form. Is it? It would be nice if it was. No, it wouldn't be nice. It would, it would be boring, actually. Okay, so the three in the front should go where? To the back. And I have two cosine of something, something, plus three. All right, so the inside, remember, is where the fun's at. The X term is already first, but I need to factor out the coefficient of X. What's the coefficient of X? Pi fifths. Cool. So when I factor the pi fifths out of pi fifths x, I know the first term is just going to be x. That's a no-brainer. But what the heck is the second term going to be? Well, you might want to go off to the side and do that. When you factor out, you're actually doing what operation? Dividing. So really you're taking 3 pi fifths and you're dividing it by pi fifths. And, of course, you could then stay, change, flip. This one turns out to be pretty nice, though. It turns out to be 3. So in this case, you probably didn't need to do that. But in general, that's how it works. What you started with divided by what you're factoring out. Do it off to the side. That's your bench work. Get your number and then bring it back into the problem. And notice we have two sets of parentheses there, don't we? One to set off the entire angle and then one to set off the phase shift. And if you don't know if that's right or not, then just quickly redistribute the pi fifths, and you see that it does work. All right, so there it is in standard transformation form. Now we're going to come over here and list our values. Let me shrink this down, space bag it. There we go. We want the absolute value of A, the absolute value of B, C, D, P, and R. Now what is the absolute value of A? Two. So what is the amplitude? Two. What if the A value had been negative 2? What would the amplitude be then? Still 2. Amplitude, like reference angles, have to be what? Positive. All right, B, the number of cycles in 2 pi, is pi fifth. So how many cycles are we going to see between 0 and 2 pi? Pi fifth. Yeah, whatever that number is. The exact value, pi fifth. That's the number of cycles in 2 pi. Let's jump down and find the period then. The period is always 2 pi over B. So it's 2 pi over pi fifths, which stay change flip that, and what do you get? 10. Yeah. Again, show more steps if you need to. 2 pi over 1 times pi over, or 5 over pi. The pi's divide out, and you get 10. The period's 10. So for the first time, we actually have a period that is not a multiple of pi. So we're not going to have any pi on the x-axis. Aw. And generally, that's how it works. If you have a pi in your B value, you will not have a pi on your x-axis, and vice versa. All right, let's go with uh, C. The minus 3 means we're shifting the whole thing what? Right 3. And the D is your new sinusoidal axis, which is plus 3. So what is the equation of the sinusoidal axis? Y equals 3. Good. 
I might ask you that on the free response. What is the equation of the sine total axis? It's a horizontal line, so it's y equals. Now the range. Let's get the range very quickly, which helps us with our sketch. You don't have to show all the intermediate steps, so this time I won't. You take your d value, which is 3, and you subtract the amplitude. So 3 minus 2 is 1, so that's your lower bound. And 3 plus 2, which is 5, is your upper bound. So there's gathering up all the evidence. Now, we are shifting it right three units, but our period is 10. So we might have to make new marks. If you're not sure, make a sacrificial axis. So I'm going to do that. There's zero. I'll leave a little bit over here to the left. I'm going to come out here and call that 10. There's the length of one cycle. Half of 10 is 5. Half of 5 is 2.5. So what's the most important value of x on this entire function? 2.5, because before the shift and after the shift, the critical values are still going to be two and a half units away from each other. Now we're scooting the entire graph to the right three units. So is that just going to pick it up and set it back down in the same track? No. If I had to shift it right two and a half units or five units or ten units, then it would be. But we have to make new marks. So for what it's worth, if you just want to keep labeling, that would be 7.5. And if you come back one, it's negative 2.5, so on and so forth. So here's why it's important to get your sacrificial axis. Everything moves right three units. So the y-axis, which is at 0, is now going to be right here at 3. Are we going to have then another critical value between my new y-axis and the actual y-axis? My new y-axis is at 3. That's where 0 went. Am I going to have on my final graph another critical value between the y-axis and my new y-axis? The answer is yes. Of course we are. Because guess if 0 went over to 3, guess where negative 2.5 is going to go? It's going to go over to 0.5. How do we get that number? All you have to do is add 3 to each of these old values. But the spacing is what's important. Zero is no longer going to be a critical value. Zero moves over to three. Negative 2.5, the next critical value to the left, moves over three units to 0.5. All right? So the spacing now between the y-axis and your first critical value is going to be different than the spacing between the two critical values. And that's what I'm going to be looking for. So let's go ahead and make our final graph. So here's the y-axis, and because our values are entirely positive, it's going to draw it like that. Now I'm going to put my critical values down. 0.5 is my first positive critical value. So I'm going to draw that about right here, 0.5. Now here's where you have to be careful. The distance between the y-axis and 0.5 is not your quarter cycle counting interval, is it? No. Your quarter cycle counting interval is 3. So I'm going to come out here and call that the next critical value, which is what? No. I'm sorry, the, the, the spacing is 2.5. Sorry. The shift is 3. The spacing is 2.5. So that's going to be 3. How far is it from 0.5 to 3? 2.5 units. So there's two different spaces there that I'm going to be looking at. The distance between the y-axis and your first critical value, and a lot of people miss that first critical value, and then the distance, of course, is always between consecutive critical values. So that is the distance there that you need to now preserve. So as you go to the right, I'm trying to keep the distance between the critical values roughly the same. And now when you go back to the left of the y-axis, same thing. You keep the distance between your critical values the same. And I'll come back one more. Put about right there. All right, does that make sense? So the distance between each critical value and the distance between the y-axis and the next critical value. Now you could just label everything by counting by what? 2.5. So the next one would be 3 plus 2.5 is 5.5 plus under 2.5 is 8. And then 10.5. And then 13. And then 15.5. So on and so forth. 
And as I go back to the left, 3 minus 2.5, of course, is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 minus 2.5 is negative 2, and then negative 4.5. Now, where did our y-axis move? It moved to 3. So now I'll put my dotted line at 3. And there you go. You have just completed the most fun, most challenging part of sketching sinusoids. When your phase shift is by some number that's not a multiple of a quarter cycle, you have to make new marks. All right, so the y-axis should be just as easy as always. There's one. I'll come up here and call that 5. What's the midpoint between 1 and 5? 3. Add them and divide by 2. So you get 3. That's your sinusoidal axis. So now I'll draw the dotted line all the way through there. And then just make sure you have at least 9 critical values. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I have 9 exactly. Perfect. Do I have at least one negative critical value? Yes, I have two, which is fine. Now we are finally ready to put our critical values down. And so that returns us to the original problem. It was a positive cosine. So positive cosine starts where? Pi. So now we go to our new x-axis and y-axis intersection, which is at 3, 3. And we go up to the high point, which is at 3, 5. Boom. And now everything is predetermined from there. So if we go to the right, uh, axis low, axis high, axis. And then moving back to the left, we have axis at 0. 0.5. Is x equals 0 a critical value, the y-axis? No. For the first time, it's not. So our next critical value is at negative 2, low, and then back at 4.5 for an axis. And now all you got to do is connect the dots with your quarter cycle arcs. And then you continue it past with an arrow on both sides. You lose a point on the test if you don't continue it past your last points with arrows. So it's the little thing, of course, you know at this point, that can cost you little points here and there. And they add up. That's it. So nothing is labeled that's not important. The high point, the low point, the sinusoidal axis, and only the critical values. <clears throat> so from there... Now I can ask you any kind of pieces of information. I could ask you for the uh, location of a local maximum, which would be at x equals 3 or 13. I could ask you for the absolute minimum value, which would be what? 1. Uh, I could ask you for um, a positive interval where the function is decreasing. And you could say from 3 to 8. Um, I could ask you for the coordinate of an inflection value. What would the coordinate of an inflection value be? 5.5 comma 3, yeah. Does this function have any symmetry, even, odd, or neither? No, because we shifted it a funky amount. It has no longer x-axis or origin symmetry or, or y-axis symmetry. So there's no symmetry anymore. But now, of course, the real fun is writing equivalent equations in terms of a different trig function. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, if you're going to write equations, remember, all you have to do is look for the characteristic points on the graph. So we started with a positive cosine. Let's go ahead and make it a negative cosine. I'm going to copy this right here. All right, so a negative cosine now, I'll use the different flavors. I just put a negative in front of the 2, and now I just need to look for a low point on the graph. Where do we have a low point? I see two of them, right? Either a negative 2 or positive 8. Remember, it goes in as the opposite sign in the equation, so either plus 2 in the equation or minus 8. I like the plus 2, but x minus 8 works equally as well. Uh, let's do the other two. So now I will let's do a positive sign. So I have a positive 2 sign. And everything else stays the same, but for the phase shift. Positive sign, what are we looking for? Axis going up. Where's the first positive x value we're on the axis going up? Positive 0.5. So in the equation, it's going to be minus 0.5. And then the last one, 
course, not to have the feelings hurt, we want a negative sign. So I'll throw a negative in front of the two, put a sign there. And now for a negative sign, we're looking for what feature? Axis going down, which the first positive value of X where that happens is? Three? No, 5.5. Three is a high point. That's a positive cosine. 5.5 is on the axis going down. Right. Sine is always on the axis. Always on the axis. There you go. So the thing that would give students the most fits is that 0.5 right there. Because some students, if they don't do the rough draft, x-axis might miss that value. Okay? And they try to use the y-axis as a critical value or they skip it all together and go all the way to negative two. And if you do that, if you're spacing things correctly, and you notice that one of your little pieces of sign is like uncharacteristically wide or narrow, then you probably skip the critical value. So that's what I'll be looking for on your graph. Is the spacing between consecutive critical values the same? And is the distance off your y-axis reasonable? <clears throat> all right, let's try it again, example 12. Gets at least two cycles of bless you, this one. <clears throat> F of X equals negative two thirds sine of two thirds X plus pi thirds minus one. Is this in standard transformation form? No. So let's go ahead and put it into standard transformation form. The negative two thirds looks good. The sine looks good. On the inside, there's some work to be done. What do I need to factor out from both terms? A two thirds. Good. So two thirds parentheses X. And what do I get when I factor out a two-thirds from a pi-thirds? Well, let's see. Pi-thirds divided by two-thirds. What you started with divided by what you're factoring out. Stay, change, flip, and you get what? Pi-half. If you don't know how to do it in your head, go off to the side and do it. What you started with divided by what you're factoring out. And then bring it back in, and it's plus pi halves. Now, very quickly, mentally redistribute. What's two-thirds times pi halves? Pi thirds. Eutimus. Okay, so there it is. Now we can go ahead and collect our information, our A, B, C, D, P, and R. The absolute value of A is what? Two-thirds, and I'm going to make a note to myself to flip the highs and lows. So what is the amplitude of this function? Positive two-thirds. Excellent. How many cycles are we going to see between zero and two pi? Mm -hmm. Also two-thirds, right? So not even a full cycle. So the period is going to have to be larger to see a full cycle. So C, D, what is C? Left, left pi halves. Good. Left pi halves. The D is down one. So the sinusoidal axis equation is what? Y equals negative 1. What's the period? Well, it's 2 pi over B. B is 2 thirds. So 2 pi divided by 2 thirds is the same as 2 pi over 1 times what? 3 halves, which turns into 3 pi. Makes sense. I only saw 2 thirds of a cycle between 0 and 2 pi, so I needed to go another third of 2 pi I need to go another third, sorry, of the period to get to the full thing, which is another pi. And then the range. Um, negative one minus two thirds is what? Negative five thirds. And then negative one plus two thirds is? Negative one third. So there's your range, fun with fractions. Okay, so now notice our B value does not have a pi in it, which means our x-axis will have a pi in it. So I will give you, if you have to make new marks, relatively nice numbers. So if you will have pi on your x-axis, you'll be shifting at a multiple of pi. If you don't have pi on the x-axis, you'll be shifting at a multiple of a constant. I used to not do that, but I'm getting nicer as I get older. So let's go ahead and make our sacrificial x-axis. Um, we'll do it right here. There's zero, and we come out the period length, which is 3 pi. Half of 3 pi is 3 pi halves. 
What's half of 3 pi halves? 3 pi fourths. So now we're counting by 3 pi fourths. So 3 pi fourths, 6 pi fourths, this would be 9 pi fourths. 0, and what would be the first negative critical value? Negative 3 pi fourths. Now comes the shift. If I am shifting everything left pi halves, it would be equivalent to subtracting pi halves from each of these values if I'm moving everything left pi halves. But the key question is, where does that go in relation, where does the y-axis go in relation to 3 pi fourths? Pi halves is how many pi fourths? 2 pi fourths. So I'm picking it up and I'm moving it left, not quite a full critical value. Okay? So the y-axis moves right here, which is not quite a full critical value. Now notice the spacing off of here, off the old critical value. That's going to be the same over here. 3 pi fourths moves to the left, not quite a full critical value. 3 pi halves moves to the left, not quite a full critical value. So all my new critical values are just going to be a smidgen to the right, essentially, of the old critical values. But here we go again. I have a spacing off the y-axis that's different than the spacing between my critical values. <clears throat> what is the first critical value that's positive? What is it? 3 pi fourths is what it used to be, and I subtracted pi halves, so what's 3 pi fourths minus 2 pi fourths? 1 pi fourths. Good. So my first positive critical value is pi fourths, and my first negative critical value is negative pi halves. So what does that mean when I'm setting it up? The distance between uh, the critical values or, or the, the, dis the first critical value to the left is twice as far as the first critical value to the right of the y-axis. Spacing, all right? So let's go ahead and transfer them now to our final graph. Y-axis, x-axis way up there, because all of our values are negative. And let's go ahead and put our critical values down. <clears throat> if you want to put the first one here, that's fine. You can call it pi-fourths. And if pi halves is really 2 pi fourths, then here's how what you want to do. This distance here, you want to kind of double that, eyeball it. So there would be negative pi fourths, negative 2 pi fourths. So something about right there. So it's like two of those spaces. And that would be negative pi halves. And there is your new y-axis. So really the two most important critical values to get down on your final graph are the ones that are immediately to the left and right of the y-axis. Those are the two most important. Because the one, uh, on one hand, it establishes the distance between the y-axis and one of them, which kind of sets your scale. And then the distance between the two, of course, is what you want to now keep relatively uniform. And I'll put another one over here. See how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that enough for two cycles? No. Nope. I'll just extend it out here to the right and put one more. Rough draft x-axis. Rough draft x-axis. Because your final graph only must show what's actually the critical values. All right, so how far apart are all my critical values? What was our quarter cycle interval? 3 pi 4. So that's a fourth of 3 pi, so if you'd like to get it that way. So now I just got to count by 3 pi fourths. So if the first one's at 1 pi fourths, what would be the next critical value? Pi. 4 pi fourths. The next one would be 7 pi fourths. The next one would be 10 pi fourths, which is 5 pi halves. And then 13 pi fourths. And then plus another 3 is 16 pi fourths, which is what? 4 pi, and then 19 pi fourths, so on and so forth. So keep adding 3 pi fourths and simplify. It requires a little bit in your head, but you could do it, or do it off to the side and bring it back in. Now let's go ahead and subtract. Pi fourths minus 3 pi fourths is negative 2 pi fourths, which is negative pi halves. Negative 2 pi fourths minus 3 pi fourths is negative 5 pi fourths. 
so on and so forth. You're still counting by three by four. And congratulations, the hardest part is done. Okay, but it's not that hard. Now we get our uh, y-axis. So I'm going to call that negative one third. I'm going to come down here to the bottom and call that negative five thirds. And then right in the middle should be the d value of negative one. And we'll draw our axis. All right, so now I've got to get my sacrificial axis out of the way. There we go. And once you have that, now you're ready to put your critical values. So this turns out to be a negative sign, a negative sign. So we're going to go to our new origin, and negative sign starts on the axis and goes low, right, instead of high. So we'll have a dot at negative 5 halves and negative 1. And then from there we go low. Is the y-axis the critical value? Nope. It's at 5 fourths, which is just over here. I better move this over. There we go. Right there. And then axis and then high, axis low. I will also be checking to see if you are oscillating by about the same amount above and below your sinusoidal axis. Turn the corner and then connect the dots. So again, notice the y-axis is not a critical value. Yeah. At least one negative critical value. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Your axis moves into negative land, that could count as your critical value. Okay, so then from there, all we have to do is write equivalent equations. So let's go ahead and copy this one here and uh, find some room here. Paste. That's a negative sign, so let's go ahead and do a positive sign. And again, the only difference is going to be other than the sign in the front, the phase shift. So positive sign now, we're looking for a what? Going up. So axis going up. So pi would work great, wouldn't it? So a minus pi, that would work. Uh, maybe bring this in a little bit closer. There we go. So there's one of them. Um, let's do another one. Let's get rid of the sign and do a negative cosine, All right, so now I have a negative two-thirds cosine. Negative cosine starts where? Low point. Where's the most convenient low point? Pi fourths. And it's in positive land, so it needs to be minus pi fourths in the equation. And then finally, the last one, I'll put it down here. We need to do a positive cosine. So positive cosine starts at a high point. Let's shift to the one over here in negative land, which is at negative 5 pi fourths. So what would it be in the equation? Plus 5 pi fourths. Yeah. So again, this is the type of question that will be your free response. You've got the easy phase shifts down. Now you've got to practice these. Okay. And all it is is making your rough draft x-axis. The people who struggle with this are the people who are reluctant to do a rough draft x-axis. You might have to do it twice. If you want to make a complete graph and then call that your rough draft complete graph and then do another one, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with having to do a problem more than once. So that was what we're going to stop at today. Tomorrow we're going to finish the notes, which is going backwards from graphs to equations. And um, we'll talk about the test briefly. But if you've noticed, if you noticed on the pre-cal matters page, has anyone seen this right here, 5.4b, how to sketch a sinusoid must read? If today is still a struggle for you, of course, you can watch the video again. But here is a copy, handwritten uh, by yours truly, that basically talks you through what we just did step by step by step, all right?
And then, of course, at the bottom it says practice, 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 repeat. All right, so tomorrow we'll finish, talk about the test, test on Wednesday. Make sure you turn your calculators in.